Hello, the internet. Welcome to Cracking the Cryptic. I'm Damano, and this is my puzzle, Taco Bowl 3, Ring of Fire. As of the time of recording this video, all three Taco Bowls are maintaining 100% approval on Logic Masters Germany, which I'm very pleased with. Before I get started here, you need to know that this video will include a complete solution path for this puzzle as part of the setting process. If you haven't yet solved this puzzle and you want to do so without spoilers, you should pause this video and follow the link in the description below and then come back here when you're done. Simon recently did a solve video of this puzzle. That happened because a few weeks ago I sent him an email that said I was interested in making a creator video for this puzzle, but it hadn't been on the channel. Would that be a problem? He told me to send the puzzle in so it could be tested, and shortly thereafter, his solve video went up. I told him beforehand that it was one of the best puzzles I've made so far. I did not tell him it was also the hardest 9x9 Sudoku I'd ever made. I didn't tell him that two people had come to me independently to tell me it was the most difficult puzzle they'd ever solved without help, or that it took Tyrganis three days to finish it. And I did not suggest that he solve Taco Bowls 1 and 2 first so he could get a feel for how the rules work. I didn't tell him these things for one very simple reason. The creation of Taco Bowl 3 actually begins back in July 2020 with a puzzle by Stefan Bura called Stacked Sandwiches which is this puzzle. This is an embedded sandwich Sudoku, where the arrows act like normal sandwich crusts, summing the numbers between them. So you can see here that 7 plus 5 is 12, which is the 1 here and the 2 here. These 4 add to 18, and so on. Longtime viewers may recognize this puzzle, because Simon posted a solve of it on August 7th, 2020. It's a very good puzzle, and both it and the video have been rated very highly. Hopefully, there will be links to all of the puzzles and videos I mention in the description below. One person who really enjoyed Stefan's puzzle was a setter who appeared on the channel, who you may recognize by the name Udikos. Udikos really likes the embedded sandwich rule set, and his fondness for it inspired a brand new setter to start making puzzles in August 2020. That setter is named Kodak. His very first published Sudoku ever was an embedded sandwich called Lunchbox, which is this one. A few months later, he made another embedded sandwich Sudoku called Udikos's Breakfast, which is this one. This is where my journey begins. At the beginning of March 2021, I decided to clear out some puzzles from Codex's back catalog, and Udikos's Breakfast caught my eye immediately because I like food. While I was solving it, I got confused by the clue in column 7. I'd established that one of these two cells had to have a 3. I hope I'm not giving up the secret of the puzzle here. But for some reason, I thought the column 7 arrows were summing themselves as well as the cells between them, even though that wasn't the rule set in use. If these cells are included in the sum, then either they're a 30-something clue, or a 42 with a 3 outie, or a 43 with a 2 outie. But no matter what, it would place 3 in one of these three cells, and it wouldn't be available here. So I did what any self-respecting solver would do in such a situation. I sent a message to Codec on Discord to complain about it. When I realized what my mistake was, I decided that there was actually a lot of potential in a rule set that worked the way that I had misunderstood it. And I wrote the idea down. I solved Udikos's breakfast on March 4th, and I created the first Taco Bowl Sudoku on March 6th. Now I've told you all of that history to draw attention to something that I tell any new setter who asks for advice. If you want to set great puzzles, you need to solve great puzzles. There are two reasons for this. First, solving puzzles makes you a better setter, and setting puzzles makes you a better solver. By solving great puzzles, you can learn from them by seeing what they do that makes them so good, and then hopefully incorporate something like that into your own puzzle. Then, the other side of the coin, setting puzzles allows you to come up with tricks for the solver to find, which you will then be able to look for and use to your advantage when solving someone else's puzzle. It's a great big feedback loop, 
and if you want to get better at setting, it's a good idea to throw yourself into it. The second reason is that that sort of chaining inspiration happens all the time in the puzzle setting community. Stefan Bure set a puzzle, Udikos liked it, so Kodak created more of them, and solving Kodak's puzzles inspired me to make mine. And it sometimes goes even deeper than that. Tirganis made a puzzle called Kitchen Sink, which inspired Kodak to make Carpet Beater, which has appeared on the channel. That puzzle inspired me to make one called Dirty Tricks, which has not appeared on the channel. But that inspired Kodak to make Pufferfish, which gave me ideas that went into a puzzle I made called 321 Magic. Setters are inspired by each other all the time just by solving each other's puzzles, getting an idea from them, and running with it. Solving puzzles will help you make puzzles. So that's everything that led up to making the first taco bowl Sudoku. So named because the crusts are part of the sum and you eat the bowl in a taco bowl. I'm very clever. The rules work as follows. When two arrows face each other, they are crusts of a sandwich. The digits in the crust cells must be the sum of the sandwich, including the crust, in some order. For example, if there are two arrows with three cells between them, two valid solutions could be 74862 or 24867, because either way, the digits 7 plus 4 plus 8 plus 6 plus 2 equal 27. The first thing I did when I came up with the rule set was figure out how big the tacos could be given the sizes of the gaps. Before I could make a puzzle with the rule set, I needed to fully understand how it worked. As Simon quickly pointed out in his solve, the space between the arrows must add to nine times the tens digit, and the units digit is basically irrelevant. That means the tens digit and the filling basically create a killer cage that adds to 10, 20, 30, or 40 and the units digit plus the outies add to 35, 25, 15, or 5. That gives us this table right here. There it is. The most interesting parts of that table to me are the gaps of size 1, 2, and 5, because they only have one option. When you're looking for a way to constrain the grid, anything that is immediately forcing like this is extremely valuable. This was largely the basis for Taco Bowl 1, which is on the screen now, which was my first attempt to use the rule set. A lot of the break-in for this puzzle is very basic. This one cell filling must be a 9, because this is a, bleh, because this is a 1x taco, which makes this a 2x taco, and so on. There are mostly one-step deductions until you get a bit further into the puzzle when clues start working together. I gave this to Kodak to test first because his puzzle is what inspired it, and his feedback was extremely positive, so I suspected I was onto something good. While Taco Bowl 1 was going through testing, I started experimenting with the rule set in a Discord DM conversation with Udikos. We came up with a few interesting setups, which started with this. Udikos noticed that because the green cells must add to 9, by the nature of a taco inside another taco, and because the red cells and the blue cells each have to add to a multiple of 9, this cell can only be a 9 to make the box work. That got me thinking about parallel tacos, which led me to this setup. This is actually a remarkably compelling setup because the tacos all interact with each other. Box 5 must have two 18 fillings and a 9 filling to add to 45, and this taco needs a 1, but this taco over here also needs a 1, so that tells us that the 1 goes here. But this doesn't have to be a 1x taco, this could be the units digit. And there are several other immediate deductions to be had as well. You can also put a taco across the box this way, and because there's already a 9 filling in one of the rows, the vertical taco is forced to be a 20-something sum. It's a really nice setup. We had this discussion on March 8th, and that night I spent a few hours with it, rotated this setup to go against the right-hand side of the grid, and it became Taco Bowl 2. More meat. 
The first taco bowl was an introductory puzzle both for the solver and for me as a setter. For the second one, I was more practiced with the rule set, so the puzzle is a little more mature, and it uses the same restrictions in different ways. I was also able to remove a couple clues during testing because my test solve didn't make use of them, and I didn't want them to distract the solver. Ideally, your puzzle should only have the clues that are necessary for the solve, unless testing has revealed that it is far too difficult and needs something added to it to make it more manageable. I gave Taco Bowl 2 to both Codec and Uticos for testing before releasing it to the Discord, and once again, they both really liked it. In my intended solution path, there are two deadly patterns at the end that are resolved by a single taco, which I really like, but there were a couple things that I wasn't fully satisfied with. First, I didn't really like how much of a gimme this one cell filling is. I wanted to make a taco bowl that didn't have one. And second, the two deadly patterns were nice, but what I really wanted was to make one that would have coloring at the end to disambiguate things. So I knew that I had to make a third taco bowl. Taco bowl three began with eight arrows and a question. Wouldn't this be an interesting beginning? I hadn't done any logic on it at all, but I knew that having a ring of clues like that would be compelling. I showed it to Udikos, who immediately noticed that the top right and bottom left corners had to be threes. If you've watched Simon's solve of Taco Bowl 3, you will immedi immediately recognize that conclusion as being wrong, because they can also be fours. But don't worry, it'll come back to bite me later. After I added that ring to the grid, I added this inner ring, and committed to the name Ring of Fire. After all, after going through three taco bowls of increasing intensity, well, you know. When I added this ring, I made another wrong assumption, that these had to be 1-2 pairs, with a 1x taco in the columns and 2x taco in the rows. This happens to resolve the possibility of fours in the corners of the big ring, because that would require two, three pairs into these cells, and if there's already a one-two pair here, that's going to produce two twos in one of these two boxes, which breaks. But that's not why I thought it was true. I just got the logic wrong. Again, this will come back to bite me later. At this point, I added the five-cell taco in column eight, because that allows me to put a three down here and the six gap taco in column five, which forces a three in here. Since I wanted the grid to resolve to pairs, I tried to find clues that would do that. I didn't want clues that would fully resolve, I wanted clues that would almost resolve. After some experimentation, I ended up here. This grid resolves, but it has a few problems. First, that odd cell is an extra constraint that I really didn't want to have. I tried to get a diagonal taco to do the job, but I couldn't spot one, so this was a last resort. Second, the solution path doesn't really have a bunch of pairs to resolve with coloring at the end. It tries, but it can be bypassed with some clever math. Plus it relied on this inner ring starting out with 1-2 pairs, which is wrong, and proving their 1-2 pairs requires a lot of heavy bifurcation. But of course, I didn't realize that they weren't 1-2 pairs at the time so I thought it resolved neatly, and I saved it. If you want to give it a try, there should be a link for it below. Fair warning, it took me almost two hours. So I didn't like this version of the puzzle, but I did like most of it. I really liked the rings, and the tacos in columns five and eight because they really work well together. So I removed everything else and restarted from here. This is as far as these arrows can take you on their own if you assume threes in the outer corners and one-two pairs in the inner corners, as I did. Since the biggest problem I had with the first version was that it didn't give me lots of pairs to color at the end, I very heavily prioritized creating pairs in the grid. The easiest pairs to work with would be the ones that went with the 30-something clues in the large ring, but 6-9 was already resolving, so... Instead, I decided to work with the 7-8 pairs and the 4-5 pairs, mostly the 7-8 pairs. Any clue I added to the grid 
needed to create at least one of those pairs, must not resolve any 7-8 pairs, as they were my main focus. And if it resolved something that wasn't a 7-8 or a 4-5 pair, that was a bonus, not a goal. So I stared at the grid for a few minutes, and then I added this clue, this arrow right here. This resolves a lot of stuff all over the place. It immediately places a 1 here, which forces a 4-5 pair into here. This becomes a 2, 1 goes over here, resolves the stuff over here. We got a bunch of 2s and 1s resolved all over the place. We get an x-wing on 1s into these cells, which forces a 1 here. And this 4-2 pair is resolved, as well as this 5-4. And we also get some other fun bonus stuff over here. This one clue is basically magic. It does a lot for us very quickly. At this point, it was really difficult to come up with a useful clue to add, because most of them either didn't produce 4, 5, or 7, 8 pairs, or they resolved things I didn't want to resolve yet. For instance, I tried placing a taco here, but the X-Wing on ones forces a one into here, so the only way for this to work is with two, three, four, and I really don't want to resolve a four if I can avoid it. However, when I stared at this clue for long enough, I realized that it didn't need to have a one in that square. If I moved the column five taco one column to the left, then this row six taco would be forced to put place a two here. And that would force pairs of 4, 5, and 7, 8 into these two cells. So I did it. We take out those. And we got a 3 here, 2 here. Those go away. and we move our three pencil marks over, and now this is forced to be a two. And this two does work. It's the only way to make the taco function, but also we get our one-two pair here. So they come out of the grid. One previously removed that, so that actually becomes a two. Now we get a whole bunch of four, five, seven, eight, pairs into here. And we are well on our way to something that is more like what we need to get to. We also get a 2 down here. You may have noticed at this point that the way I'm adding clues is almost like I'm trying to solve the puzzle rather than create it. And that is actually exactly true. Setting a Sudoku has been described in the Discord server many times as solving a puzzle that doesn't exist yet. The way that I'm choosing where to place clues in this puzzle is automatically creating a logical solution path, which is a big part of what makes a puzzle enjoyable. Some people try to start with a finished grid and work backwards, thinking that since they're beginning with a completed puzzle, they're at an advantage because they can't add a clue that breaks it. But the truth is that setting in reverse makes it much more difficult to create a solid solution path because you didn't use one to get where you were going. I always recommend starting from an idea and working your way forward. Now, at this point, I noticed that box 8 is very constrained in column 5. So, I added this clue. And what this does is magic, complete and utter magic. It forces one into here, cleans that up. The only way for this to work now is with a 3-6 pair, which gives us 9, 6, 3, 
into this cell, we must place a nine. That's not right. Into that cell, we must place a five. Nine goes in here. That has to be a one. And now we have almost the entire grid covered in four, five, and seven, eight pairs and quadruples. In fact, we have so many four, five, seven, eight quadruples at this point that I was actually worried I wouldn't be able to separate them. And that's when I noticed this string of cells right here. I realized that if I placed a taco along this row, I could force a four, five pair in the filling and that would have a serious knock-on effect for the rest of the grid. So I did it. And what that does is it forces 4, 5 into here, which gives 6 there. That has to be a 9, which I could have done earlier. 7, 8 there turns these into 4, 5 pairs these in the seven eight pairs this now resolves the six three here which is a deadly pattern that I really wasn't looking forward to previously four or five pair in the row gives us a nine there which gives us a nine here and into here we must place a six and at this point we have the entire grid down to four, five, and seven, eight pairs, except for these four quadruple cells, all in rows one and two. There's already a taco in row one. So I scanned row two, and I found this option available. And that immediately gets everything down to pairs. So at this point, I'd managed to force a whole bunch of seven, eight, and four, five pairs, which was exactly what I'd set out to do. But I had a problem. Had I created a conflict? Did the seven, eight, and four, five pairs align in such a way that I was going to force eight plus four and eight plus five to both equal 12? Or seven plus four and four, seven plus five? To make sure I hadn't broken it, I had to start coloring. And I'll do the seven, eight pairs in blue and green because, I mean, why not really? And by coloring the seven, eight pairs, we can see that they all line up nicely. And importantly, we see that green 7, 8 is in both of the relevant tacos. So when we color the 4, 5 pairs, luckily, the 4, 5 pairs up here are entirely self-contained. They don't reach down here, which means the way this ended up working out, a 4 or a 5 up here will inform 7, 8s all over the grid which can then inform four fives starting here. And so we get the rest of our grid colored in. So that gives us this coloring and no more potential conflicts as long as I can find a path to the end. At this point, I'd already used pretty much every horizontal and vertical taco I could find room for. So once again, the hunt began for a diagonal taco to resolve the grid. When I noticed that the long positive diagonal happened to have a convenient sum, I discovered that placing a four here resolves all the pairs and allows us to finish the grid 
in a very nice way. So that will give us the finished solution. And that is how I placed all the clues in this puzzle. But you may remember that I said earlier, my wrong assumptions were going to come back to bite me. I sent this puzzle to Udikos, and not long after, he sent me back this, and a note that he couldn't spot the next step. It was at this point I knew I'd messed up. Because my entire logical path had been based on the assumption that this inner ring had to have one, two pairs in the corners. And that is not the case. At this point, because everything had been based on a wrong assumption, I didn't know whether my puzzle had a unique solution. But I did know that if I could force a one, two pair into this cell, then it would. The question then became, how do I do that? The good news is Udikos told me that at that point in his solve, row two broke. The bad news is he told me that at 1230 in the morning, so it didn't fully register. I stayed up until 530 looking for a way to prove that the column four taco was a 4x taco, because if this cell couldn't be a two, three, or four, then this would have to be a 2x taco, and it never occurred to me in those hours to look at row two because I was laser focused on the column. Eventually, I came up with a long chain of logic from this point that involves a 7-8 pair in box 3 and an 18 sandwich in column 3 with a 2 and 7 for the filling and a hidden single 3 in this cell, which makes the row 3 sandwich impossible to complete because these cells need to add to 15, but they both see a 7-8 or a 6-9, and that makes it impossible to finish. Therefore, column 4 must have a 4x taco. When I showed this to Udikos, he was the one who pointed out that the 7-8 pair in box 1 forces both a 7 and 8 into the row 2 taco and breaks it, because 27 in 4 cells without 3 uses 7 or 8, but not both. However, the end result was still that the column 4 taco was forced, and that prevents the row 4 taco from being a 1x taco, putting 2 back in row 4 column 3, and making the puzzle unique again. This was also when I noticed that my original path never actually ruled 4 out of the outer ring, especially in this cell, which Simon actually overlooked during his solve. It gets ruled out pretty quickly though, because it forces a 2 into this cell, which puts 4 and 2 into these, and now the smallest these can be is 5, 6, 7, which add to 18, but in order for the taco to work they have to add to 15, so it's broken. So 4 does get ruled out. At this point, my solution path was fully complete, so I released the puzzle for public testing and onwards to release. There are two points I want to make with that last part. First, don't worry about showing another setter your work in progress. I am very familiar with the urge to keep your unique creation close to your vest so that someone else can't swoop in and do it first. But that's really not a risk here. Setting a Sudoku is often a collaborative endeavor, and even just bouncing ideas off of each other can inspire new puzzles or make the puzzles you're working on better. The row 2 restriction here is obvious in hindsight, but it was Udikos who found it, not me. Without Udikos' eyes on the puzzle, there's no telling how long it would have taken me to spot the easier method. And I promise, as well, if you show a puzzle to another setter, they're not going to try to steal it from you, because they know you're working on it and they will respect that. Second, and perhaps the most important takeaway from this video, is that in your time setting puzzles, you are going to make mistakes. You'll make wrong assumptions, or you'll not spot some important logic, or you may even find out that the entire premise of your puzzle is impossible to make work. I once spent an entire week trying to get a constraint to work, only to find out that it's impossible to get a valid grid with it. 
I guarantee that for every puzzle an experienced setter releases, there are at least two or three that had to be scrapped. It will happen to you. What you need to do when it does is not worry about it. Sometimes it turns out there's a baked in piece of logic you didn't notice the first time that resolves it, like what happened here. Sometimes there isn't and you have to start over, like what happened with the first version of Taco Bowl 3. It's just a thing that happens, and it's an unavoidable part of the setting process. All you can do is shrug your shoulders and move on to the next one. So that's how I set Taco Bowl 3, from start to finish. From inspiration all the way to placing the final clue. I hope you enjoyed the puzzle and this video, and Simon's small existential crisis when he thought he'd broken it near the end of his solve. I know I did. And I hope I've provided some guidance for anyone out there who wants to start setting their own puzzles. I look forward to what you may create. Now, let's get cracking.